And so you heard from Nancy what the settlement agreement says. And I'm going to just go through right now with you as a review of what the trust agreement says. This trust agreement was developed through a series of consultations with Whitefish, Whitefish River First Nation members, both in the community, in the city of Sudbury, and in the city of Toronto. As well, members were invited to provide input by email and by telephone to a working group that was put together to oversee the development of this document. And this document starts out like any other legal agreement. It has a preamble. There's 10 statements there that talk about the background on how this settlement agreement came to be. And then there's a definition section. Uh, there's a schedule that talks about authorized investments, and I'll get to that because that's at the end. And the document itself is about creating a trust. The settlement agreement allows for monies to be paid over by Canada to Whitefish River First Nation. This settlement agreement says what happens with that money. And so Whitefish River First Nation is creating a trust. It's creating a vehicle to hold the money for the benefit of the First Nation. So the First Nation itself is creating the trust, and the First Nation is also the beneficiary of the trust itself. And the purpose, the reason why this trust agreement was set up is to promote the life long-term benefit of the First Nation. So it's not just looking here and now, but it's also looking to the future. There was a question about trustees, and the agreement does cover trustees. There's one corporate trustee, and there's two member trustees. There's also two ex officio trustees. The member trustees and the corporate trustee have votes. They're decision makers. The ex officio trustees are sitting together with the trustees and they participate in discussions, but they don't have a vote when it comes to making decisions about the trust. And I'm going to talk a little bit more and we'll get to Val's question about who can be a trustee on another slide. The trustees have responsibilities. When they they're making decisions about the monies, they have to follow the rules that are set out in the trust agreement. So they just can't make any decision they want to. It has to be for the long-term benefit of the community, and it has to be in accordance with this trust agreement. There's liability provisions in there that the trustees have to abide by this agreement and by the law. Trustees can be put in office, and they also can be removed. There's one process for removing the corpus trustee and a separate process for removing the member and ex officio trustees. The monies that are received are going to be uh, distributed through a per capita distribution and a portion will also be invested for other uses. I'm not going to talk to you about the investments, that's another presentation by Jeff, so I'm just going to talk to you about the uh, rules of how the trust monies are handled. The monies will be paid over into a trust account so that a separate account gets set up for the trust and all of the monies from Canada get paid into this trust account. That trust account is managed by the trustees. Initial payments can be made out of the trust monies that are received. So there were some costs incurred by the First Nation to develop the settlement agreement and the trust agreement. And those monies can be uh, taken out of the amount that's paid over, the $103 million. There's also a per capita distribution. And there's honking for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the per capita distribution is a payment that will be made to each member of Whitefish River First Nation, and the dollar amount was an amount that the chief and council put out to the members to say, what's your views on this? And as you can see, that amount now has been set at $25,000 per member. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I uh, move through this presentation. When you take that $25,000 per member out, there's still money left over. So that money can be used for other purposes. One of those purposes is for purchasing lands. And that was discussed as well by Nancy in her presentation. Monies can also be used to pay for 
costs associated with recovering from natural disasters or emergencies. Those monies can also be used for authorized loans and loan guarantees, and also to set up a community development bank account. There was discussion during the consultation period about setting up a separate bank account that would be a portion of the annual income that's earned on the trust, and this account would be available for council to use for community development purposes. And those community development purposes are specifically set out in the trust agreement. So it's not just for anything at all. Those monies can be used for protecting the First Nations Aboriginal and Treaty rights. They can be used for education, housing, culture, economic and community development, environment, and new and existing initiatives under the First Nations Capital Plan. And even with those topics that are set out, there's also a requirement in the agreement that chief and council come and ask members and present to them what this money might be used for. So there has to be meetings, two meetings with members in the first four months of a year to talk about what that community development money might be used for. And then there's also a requirement for reporting back where there's gonna be two meetings each year to account for how those monies are spent. So members will always be informed and have an opportunity to provide input on this community development bank account. There's also authorized expenses. So it will cost money to operate the trust and that's an example of what an authorized expense would be. The trust, the agreement that sets it up can be amended and there's a process for that. And trusts cannot exist for all time. That's a legal requirement, and I'll talk about that. It's on another slide. The trust agreement includes addresses for your corporate trustees and the member trustees. Once they're selected, that'll be included. And then there's some general provisions. There's also a schedule that talks about those parameters on how your monies can be invested in order that they're protected and that they grow for you. The next slide talks about trustee appointment. Now one amendment I can see on the first bullet point is selection committee to make recommendations to chief and council for member trustee appointments. It shouldn't say citizen, that was just a typo because we are talking about member trustees. So trustees must be members of Whitefish River First Nation. Okay, that's a requirement and it's set out in the definitions. So in Val's early example, you know, if Martin marries into Whitefish River First Nation, he's accepted as a citizen, could he be a trustee? Well, first off, Martin isn't a member of Whitefish River First Nation, and marriage doesn't make him a member of the First Nation, so he could not be a trustee. You have to be a member, and member is defined right at the beginning in the definition section, and it says that it's any person who's registered as a member of Whitefish River First Nation and whose name appears on the Whitefish River First Nation membership list that's maintained by Canada. So those are the people that are registered and affiliated with the First Nation. Citizen is a different category and that's governed by your citizenship code. So not only do your trustees have to be members, but they have to be at least 25 years of age. And that age was discussed with members throughout the consultation process. And that was the age that was considered to be reasonable. You have to be of good character you have to be an undischarged bankrupt. Any member trustee is also going to have to provide a criminal record check, CPIC, and also a vulnerable sector check before they're selected and every year that they are a trustee. Member trustees cannot be a member of council. So if you're holding an office of council, you could never be a member trustee. You could be an ex officio trustee, which is a trustee that's appointed but not a decision maker. And each member trustee has to be provided training on how trusts operate and the terms of the Whitefish River First Nation Trust Agreement. I talked about initial payments, so those come out 
And those are the costs, and it talks about here, legal fees that are incurred by the First Nation in educating, researching, preparing, negotiating, settling, ratifying, and then implementing the settled agree settlement agreement and the trust agreement that are not already covered in the settlement agreement. Then we get to the per capita distribution. It's a one-time payment. So it happens once, once you receive it as a member, you only get that at that time. And you have to be what's called a qualifying recipient. So there's some rules that go along with, everyone will get it, but you have to be a member who's alive on the day of the vote. You have to be 21 years old or 18 and graduated from high school or a local equivalent, whatever comes first. So if you're alive on the vote day, and if you're registered as a member, you're eligible for that 25,000. If you're 21 or 18 and have a high school diploma, you can get that money. If you don't meet those qualifying uh, requirements, it doesn't mean you don't get your money, it just means you'll get it later when you reach the age of 21 or 18 and you have your high school diploma. So that's how the per capita distribution works. Is it taxable? No, you won't be taxed on this amount. It won't affect your old age security, CPP or GIS or pension incomes. It won't affect the Ontario Works payments that you may be eligible for. Any members who live in nursing homes can also get their per capita distribution. There's no restriction on them receiving it, other than you have to be the qualifying um, recipient, which means you have to be a member of Whitefish River First Nations. Uh, in, will members in nursing homes have to use their PCD over and above what they're paying for their nursing home stay? Uh, my understanding is no, that they don't. What if you were alive at the time of the vote and passed on shortly after or before the per capita distribution was finalized? Now, you heard Nancy talk about that time between you run your ratification vote and you have a yes vote, assuming it's on the first vote, maybe it's on the second vote. That means the agreement's been ratified, but there's lots of steps that have to happen in between and time. Uh, the exact date won't be known. If a member passes during that period of time, they're still eligible for that payment and that would form part of their estate. So the amount is not lost or forfeited in any way. The trust itself will end after 50 years from the effective date unless there's a decision to resettle, create a new trust, or to transfer the trust property, so long as it's for the benefit of the First Nation. If that happens, it does require a vote. So the members would have to agree to that. That would be similar to this process. There would have to be a consultation, information meetings, and a vote run. So you, as members, would have an opportunity to provide input on that process. So that's the overview of what's in this trust agreement. Questions? <laughs>